Remy Boucher is the scientific coordinator of the Mont Megantic International Dark Sky Reserve in Quebec, Canada. He's currently a member of the IDA International Committee and received the Dark Sky Defender Award in 2015. His more than 15 years working in astronomy for the Mont Megantic National Park allowed him to acquire great expertise in mitigating light pollution. In addition to his work inside the reserve, he was also part of the committee designing the national standard against light pollution in the province of Quebec, and he is currently leading efforts in the monitoring and reduction of light pollution in Quebec's national parks network. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us today, Remy, and take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Betty Maya. Uh, I will share my uh, presentation. Uh, all right. Uh, can you see it? Uh, I guess great. so. All right. Um, so thank you for the introduction. Um, I've introduced myself in the past as a Swiss Army Knight for the Dark Sky Reserve, but yeah, my real title is a, a scientific coordinator. So Swiss Army Knight because we touch a little bit of everything, um, uh, measuring the night sky, uh, uh, working with the municipal inspectors and things like that. And since we are IDA's first international dark sky reserve and we are still the largest one, um, I wanted to share with you some of the things that we've done or that we are currently doing um, and what it means for dark sky protection on the long term and how this can inspire other places, I think. Uh, so for those who don't know where Mont Megantic is, uh, it's in Canada, in the province of Quebec, uh, which is a French-speaking province, which explains my, uh, my accent. Uh, and if we zoom in, you can see the, uh, the dotted outline on the right. This is the, the dark sky reserve. So it's about a two to three hour drive from Montreal. Uh, you can see also that there's the city of Sherbrooke that is a part of the dark sky reserve. It's by far our largest city. Uh, Sherbrooke is around 200,000 people uh, living there. Uh, there's about 25,000 more people elsewhere in the dark sky reserve. Uh, and the reserve is about the size of uh, the state of Delaware to give you an idea. So uh, 5,300. Uh, square kilometers. So it's quite large. Uh, there's 34 municipalities, so towns and villages. Uh, so that means that we have to work with a lot of people. Uh, there's the uh, three different counties. Uh, so a lot of challenges, but I think it's a uh, dark sky reserve is great because you have people, uh, well, you do have to work with more people, but it's also a benefit for, for more people. So I think that's the, the great part of a dark sky reserve. And for those of you who don't uh, are less familiar maybe with the concept of the Dark Sky Reserve because there's about 20 of them around the world. And um, so it's about like 10 times less than Dark Sky Parks. So a Dark Sky Reserve, you want to have a, a core area which is dark. Um, and to do this, you will, uh, you will have the population around, the, the cities around that will work to lower light pollution by having regulation, light management plan. Um, you're doing uh, outreach, of course. And so you can build this dark sky reserve. So it's more popular in uh, Europe because you have a lot of uh, places that are not uh, like the, the darkest possible uh, and you have to work with a lot of communities. So this is the principle of the, the dark sky reserve. Um, this is the Mount Megantic dark sky reserve. And I, I wanted to show you two main things today. And depending on the time that I will have at the end, uh, because I just don't have enough time to show you everything we've been doing lately. Uh, but I've separated in two big parts. So the first one is how um, having, like it's more about the inside of the dark sky reserve. So it's about what is done uh, in the, the different communities, uh, how this also benefits uh, and like quality of life for the people um, having uh, uh, better access to, uh, to night sky. So that's one that I want to touch. The other one is how the dark sky reserve is shining outward and how it's influencing other parts uh, in Quebec or uh, in the US or internationally. So I think that uh, we can all learn from others. I like to go and see the uh, uh, different uh, um, annual report for all the Dallas Sky places. Well, not all, there's just too many now, uh, but uh, I think it's a great resource. So um, I encourage you to, to go and see uh, ours, but others also just to learn more about what other people are doing. So those conferences are great. Uh, but I think a lot of, uh, of things goes into those reports. Uh, so the first one I want to focus is more inside the reserve, but it's starting to have also an effect outside, and it's the large adoption of uh, PC Ember LED. So uh, Daniel just uh, talked about the, the, the color of the light um, and the, the fact that there is now more and more white light. Um, we've been working very hard for the last almost 10 years 
to have access to more um, amber LED. So PC amber are phosphor converted amber LED. They are more efficient than um, the like uh, true amber or monochromatic amber LED. Uh, they, uh, they have a, a color temperature that is even a little bit lower than high pressure sodium. Um, and we've been having great success, not only for the street lights. Uh, you have a, a research center at the bottom. Uh, you have here other, uh, other uh, examples like a, a gas station. The gas pump will be lit with uh, 3000 Kelvin LEDs, but the rest of the building is uh, with a lower car temperature. Um, so these are just examples and I, I'm always seeing new, uh, new one pop up. And this is one for uh, Daniel, I just added, uh, but we do have a Costco uh, that is lit with, uh, with the same thing here. So um, they, uh, they moved and they built a, a new building and they, thanks to the regulations, they, um, uh, they went with this uh, new um, uh, PC Amber LED. Um, looks like my uh, presentation is going uh, <laughs> faster than me. Um, so just to give you an idea what, what this means for us and why did we work so hard on having Amber LED in the Dark Sky Reserve is that when we built the Dark Sky Reserve, um, we uh, focused on, on three areas, uh, three areas. They're raising awareness, so the outreach, putting in place regulations so that we could control light pollution uh, over time. Um, and also converting a lot of street lights and private lights. Uh, in fact, almost half and half at that time, uh, thanks to uh, uh, grants that we had at the beginning, we converted close to 1500 light fixtures, mostly in the inner part, what we call the zone one for the dark sky reserve, because we knew that we would have more impact by changing if, uh, those lights uh, that are closer to Mount Megansig, the observatory, uh, didn't mention, but there's a scientific observatory we welcome people, uh, we have a museum, we, we take our telescopes outside, there's the national park, this is where I work. And so we focused more on the inner part and thanks to the regulation, we hoped that uh, the, the outer part would, uh, would follow in the years, uh, the years after. So we changed a lot of lights, um, we removed every white light that we could and we put in place sodium uh, uh, high pressure because, uh, well, at that time, LED were, were not an option. They came to the market like four or five years later. And we also changed a lot of private lights, even more private lights than, uh, than street lights, uh, and also more into the, the inner part of the dark sky reserve. So when the LED came on the market, really disrupted everything, and everybody wanted to install them uh, because of the, the efficiency, uh, we saw that we would increase uh, the amount of blue light, uh, and so white light, a lot. Uh, HPS has about 10% of, uh, of blue light. And when you have a neutral white uh, 4,000 4, Kelvin LED, you're more around 30, uh, 30%. So even uh, uh, 30, uh, uh, 3,000 Kelvin LEDs, even that for us was too white. And so we worked really hard thanks to uh, Philips, which is now Signify. We had a, our first prototype in 2012. And since then, it's just been growing and growing and growing. Uh, more. Um, company, more manufacturers are offering uh, PC Ember LED as an option. It's not always easy. It's often through custom orders. Uh, some company do list them uh, and we have more regional partners also, uh, but these are more and more widely available, but you need to work to, to have them. And recently we were very happy because this year we had seven municipalities, uh, seven uh, towns that changed all of their lights, uh, their street lights, to, uh, to PC Ember LED. Uh, so all the yellow uh, and small uh, hooks, uh, these are municipalities that had already all converted the street lights to full cutoff, mostly HPS, some PC Ember LED, but the green ones um, uh, with the, the different uh, numbers of, uh, of luminaires, uh, they, all, they all converted uh, in the last year to, uh, to PC Ember LED. So this is great for us because we are now acting in the outer part of the Dark Sky Reserve. Most of those cities are 35 or 40 kilometers from the Mount Megansic Observatory, uh, which is harder always to, to, to work for us because um, you have to remind people that they are part of the Dark Sky Reserve and things like that. So it's, it's easier when you're closer to the mountain uh, and it's always harder outside. But we have, we've had great success. Sherbrooke, I didn't put the numbers, but they are changing progressively. Uh, they changed 600 last year. And uh, in the last three years, they've changed more than 3,000 on, uh, I think, 15,000 uh, total streetlights. So they are working, going great uh, with the, the transition to uh, PC Ember LED. And this is an example with the, the town of Stratford. 
uh, in winter. Uh, we do have snow here, which does <laughs> makes the light pollution wor worse. Um, and this is important. Uh, why you need to control the spectrum of light and the intensity is because when you have reflection on the ground, uh, it means you cannot only think about shielding the light um, and having no uplight. So uh, for us, it's uh, very, very important to also focus on intensity, on the timing, um, and on, on the color. Uh, other examples here, uh, still in Stratford. Uh, this one is East Angus. It's uh, the, the largest conversion that we had this year. Uh, it's also in winter for the drone picture, so you can very well see the, the color of the light. Uh, but I wanted to show you by using just the blue filter of the camera, you can really easily see where you have a lot of blue light. Uh, that's uh, such an easy way to, um, to get that information. And so if we use only the blue channel, you can see that the streets are disappearing, which means that the uh, negative impacts on health, on the ecosystem, um, on, on uh, well, the, the, some of the main impacts also on the sky glow are reduced a lot with this type of lighting. And you can really then focus on where there's still white lights. Um, they are uh, permitted in some, uh, for some uh, usage, uh, but not all. The other one I want to talk is more outside the dark sky reserve. Uh, I have the pleasure to work for the national park. Uh, so the, the team for the dark sky reserve, uh, we all work for the national park, but now we are helping other national parks uh, to maybe become dark sky parks, uh, maybe just uh, to, well, take care of their lights, make, making sure that they're using white, uh, good lights, and uh, also to have a monitoring of uh, light pollution to see what's the trend, uh, can it, get better or, or worse depending on the on the area. Uh, so you have here a map of um, all the national parks in the province of Quebec. Uh, so they are not part of the Parks Canada network. Uh, in Quebec, we do everything different. So we have our own national parks. And um, so you can see that there's a lot of potential of dark sky places, but it, it was just not on the radar for uh, those national parks. And I've been really inspired by what has been done into the uh, National Park Service in the United States, because a lot of them uh, do put emphasis on the on the preservation of the night and of the dark skies. Um, so this is what I wanted to uh, to do, and what we are currently doing with the network of national parks in Quebec. So uh, during last years, we uh, we built a, a lighting guide for the national parks, explaining the issues, explaining the solutions, uh, and what types of light uh, we could use in the, the national parks. So that means that we could also go lower than what we are doing in the dark sky reserve or what we are uh, showing to maybe bigger cities like Montreal. Uh, and we could really focus on, um, on the, the parks and the uh, protected territories. Uh, we are doing uh, lighting surveys into national parks, uh, finding the issues, converting uh, the, the bad luminaires to, uh, to good ones, uh, using a lot of amber lights there, um, not just PC amber, but uh, true amber, which will have uh, even lower impact. Um, and yes, they are a little bit less efficient than white lights, but I think it's a trade-off that is worth it, um, just like uh, everything into sustainable development. So it's not only the economics, it's also to think about the, uh, um, the society and, uh, and the environment. Uh, so this is the, the, the light part. Uh, we are also currently installing test photometers. So for, for those who don't know the test photometers, you might know, well, they don't. Here it is. Um, a test photometer is very similar to a SQM, a sky quality meter. It's a network that started in, uh, in Europe, in Spain. And uh, they basically, you, you plug them for power and you need to have a Wi-Fi access uh, and they, they run autonomously. And then you can uh, retrieve the data, which is perfect for me because I can install them in national parks and then remotely collect the, the data. So we can characterize the dark skies uh, of the, the parks but we can also see the trends over the years. So this is great. I've been installing two of those uh, last week, uh, two more just before. So we now have nine or 10 and we plan to doubling that uh, in the next year. So yeah, uh, really, uh, really glad to be part of that project. Uh, I think it's great uh, that we can finally uh, put more, um, more efforts into the, the national parks. Um, I, I do have time to show you a few more things. So those were the, the main two projects I wanted to, to share you. Uh, other ones that I think can inspire others is, uh, whoops, um, is um, the fact that greenhouses, light pollution from greenhouses are creating more and more light pollution. Uh, and um, you have a map on the right, uh, which I just used the, the, 
the, the height, so the, the 3D of the map to show the intensity, the radiance that can be seen from satellite. And you can see that a single greenhouse can just look like a, a whole city uh, from afar. Um, and we, we currently don't have large greenhouses in the dark sky reserve, but it's so much easier to take the problem uh, and act on it before it really becomes a problem. Uh, so we wanted to prevent that. And that meant to uh, adding um, uh, greenhouse uh, interior lighting into our regulations. Uh, and basically it's about putting blackout curtains. Uh, we do have to have some trade-offs. Uh, we cannot go 100% of blackouts because uh, they do need to, uh, uh, to have airflow and things like that. But still, uh, we, are, we think that we are preventing a lot of uh, potential problem because having a, a big scale greenhouse in the dark sky reserve could just be like dropping a, a nuclear bomb uh, for us. Um, so it's uh, very important. How um, much? Five minutes. Five minutes. OK, thank you, Madeline. Um, so uh, and, and this work, and you have here a, a research uh, greenhouse on Bishop's University in Sherbrooke where you can see the effect of the, the blackout curtain. So it's uh, very, very efficient. Um, education has always been very important for us at Mount Megantic. We have a museum where we, uh, we share the universe basically. Um, and uh, we have a, our own observatory where we take people. We have telescopes that we take into the cities also. Uh, so we welcome thousands of visitors uh, every year, especially in the summer. And because of the pandemic, of course, the last two years have been harder. We had to lower the capacity uh, and we turned uh, to the internet um, and live streaming so that we can reach more people. So uh, right when the, the pandemic started and the lockdowns, uh, we started to do uh, Facebook live events. Uh, we've done more than a hundred of those, uh, sharing the, uh, the site of the Comet Neowise, um, looking at the Perseum meter shower in, in, uh, in live, uh, live sessions so we could see the shooting stars in the camera. That was uh, really, really awesome. Um, and lately, I want to emphasis on, uh, put emphasis on the work of my colleagues at the Astrolab, uh, Claude, Guillaume, Nicolas. Uh, they've, they work really hard and they are doing online classroom meetups uh, with schools. Uh, they've done uh, more than a thousand of those, which last each 45 to one hour each. Uh, so they spoke with more than 24,000 uh, children, students. Uh, so it's really great. Um, it's, we have really a, a great success with this. So uh, we, we do have groups that come, school groups, but it's incredible how much more people we can reach right now by using, uh, using this. Um, we now have uh, more easily available 2200 Kilvins LED in Quebec, uh, thanks to a partnership with um, uh, what I would translate into the municip uh, Quebec's Municipality Federation. Uh, so there's a turnkey solution, which means that for a city that wants to put warmer uh, LED lights, it's now much more easier. Uh, they can go through this process and a, a team will come, uh, will do the light inventory, uh, propose the different scenarios, uh, have uh, the, the, right, uh, the right intensity for the right place. Uh, so this is great. This means that like, a lot of the work that we had to do personally uh, in the Darcia Reserve, uh, it it's, can now be taken care uh, more easily. Uh, we are doing some projects in Sherbrooke. Uh, we want to aim at the places where there's a lot of light pollution. So along a boulevard, which uh, where there is a lot of uh, um, like car dealerships and uh, big businesses, uh, we wanted to focus there because uh, we could see it on the map. Uh, there's a lot of light pollution. You can see it as the the strip, uh, the white strip uh, in the the center. Uh, and you have residential areas on both sides. So yeah, what a, a better place to lower light pollution. Um, so we, visit, we visited 40 uh, different businesses, trying to convince them because a lot of them already had uh, older lights that are uh, not subject to the, the regulation, which uh, um, is aimed at new lights or uh, the, the retrofit of lights. So we wanted to convince them. Uh, and you can see here different uh, uh, car dealerships uh, that you can see in the drone picture. So on the left, you have one with 5,000 Kelvin LED that are badly aimed. And on the right, you have one that followed the regulation. Uh, it's using PC Ember LED. 50% uh, of those will turn off at night. And you do have a, a small um, uh, portion of a white light at the front for color rendering for the cars. You have a 3,000 Kelvin LED also just, uh, just above this one. 
Um, so we hope that in the next year, uh, a lot of them will change their lives uh, following our um, what we showed them. Um, I'll take just a few minutes that I have left. Uh, we wanted to get better and better in monitoring light pollution because that was a, oh, one minute. All right, okay. so um, thank you. Uh, so we wanted to get better into monitoring and uh, measuring light pollution. We had the chance to have this picture from the National Park Service in the US in 2007, just when the Dark Sky Reserve was created. And 10 years later, we were lucky enough to have them again, uh, thanks to Jeremy White at the University of Colorado, who came. We had very similar weather almost at the same time of the year. And you can see that light pollution didn't grow. It, it even uh, got a little bit lower uh, during that 10 year period, while population grew by 12% during that time. So that's great, but we wanted to be able to do some of our uh, uh, monitoring on our own. So we uh, installed test photometer at Mount Negantic in Sherbrooke also lately. Uh, we can follow light pollution. Luckily, there's not a lot of light pollution uh, uh, at the Zenith. So uh, we are now doing also uh, uh, all sky uh, measurement thanks to the, the sky quality camera. So we can uh, sample a bit everywhere in the dark sky reserve in the national parks. We have a new dark, um, a new website, megantikdarksky.org. So you can go there. I uh, want to um, uh, thank my, uh, the team that I work with. Uh, we are all part of the national parks, uh, but uh, we all work for the, the Dark Sky Reserve also. Um, so thank you very much. And um, feel free to ask questions, reach us through our website or uh, maybe Twitter. And uh, thank you very much.